Well, he's a PhD candidate at King's College London. He took the role of colour in death and burial, particularly uh, Romanian British burial. And uh, this is the colour of death. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, so um, as Nikki just said, this is uh, going to make the standard precursor that this is you know, work in progress and <laughs> part of a larger PhD project and um, I'm not at the right up phase yet so if anyone's got any suggestions or questions or anything I'm really happy to hear them. Uh, nope, that way. So the main questions of that bigger project are what are the colours of Roman death and burial? Um, were certain colours privileged above others, and if so, why? And how impactful was colour to the sensory experience of the burial ritual for mourners? And what can it tell us about ancient responses to death? And it's really that last question that I'm going to sort of look at today. I'm going to do that through a brief survey of colour theories. I will keep it brief at the end of the day. Um, presenting a framework of symbolic colour interpretation, and then applying this framework to some dress ornaments from Roman London burials, and then a sort of a discussion of the sensory implications of this. And then obviously confusions. So why colour? Um, and I suppose what do we really mean when we discuss colour? The retinas of the human eye contain roughly 120 million rods and 6 million cones and it's really these cones that allow us to truly see colour. The colours we see are in fact light waves reflecting from the surface of an object rather than being absorbed by it. Um, and because of this Sinclair has noted that the way we perceive a colour to be is precisely the colour that it isn't. The eye responds to differences in wavelengths in order to see colour. The longer the wavelength, the warmer the hue. The human eye can see wavelengths between roughly 400 nanometers and 700 nanometers. Tiny, tiny slither here, um, with blues in the lower range and reds in the upper. And so this is why, for example, you know, at um, 10 nanometers, you can't see ultraviolet in the direction of infrared. So that's a scientific explanation of um, of what colour is. <coughs> but Early Greek writers um, give us our earliest understanding of ancient people's approaches to colour. And we know they were pondering the antithesis of black and white and associated black and white as well as primary colours with the Earth's elements. By the 4th century BC, Plato was writing that the eye could dilate to coloured stimuli. And while this is in fact incorrect, it shows that there was a will to understand sensory stimuli with colour at this time. From Rome itself, um, Pliny's extensive treatise on the natural world provides multiple examples of colour from this period. Colour is a constant refrain and often remarked upon characteristic used by Pliny to explain the world around him. To Pliny, the origin, quality or effectiveness of anything from precious stones to medicine is revealed in the colour it presents and so acts as an integral element of the ancient visual world. And this is a quote here, he's talking about um, emeralds essentially. Um, he says, um, you know, the merit of them consists in their clear colour, which has nothing thin or diluted in it, but presents a rich and humid transparency, closely resembling the tints of the sea. More recently, throughout the 20th century, colour and its role in human societies has been a popular topic within anthropology and linguistics. The basis for much of this later research um, relating to colour symbolism in Ber is Berlin Co's 1969 linguistic study, which is this one at the top here. Uh, which explored the evolutionary development of basic colour terms within heterogeneous cultural groups. Uh, with Bicker here, later sought to apply a more rounded approach by identifying linguistic associations across multiple language groups rather than Berlin and Kay's um, Anglo-centric approach. By this method, it was impossible for her to determine that many colours um, and colour terms are structured within uh, an environmental context, i.e. those related to the natural world and that these connections are universal to the human experience. Oh, sorry, go on, go on to. Um, in Jones and McGregor's 2002 publication, Colouring the Past, Chapman combined these previously mentioned strands of colour theory into a workable model by incorporating Hacking's principle of dynamic non-normalism, non um, which is the idea that categories emerge at the same time as individuals do to fit in fit them in an ever-evolving process of refinement. With the theory of cultural biographies, by combining these approaches, Chapman explored both environmental colours and cultural colour resonances of manufactured and raw materials from uh, burial artefacts from Chalcolithic Balkan sites. Chapman's approach presents a method to understand the artefacts of burial in addition to form and manufacture but as significant colour symbols in their own right. 
that color could be a gateway into understanding ritual action is, is not a new concept, and the symbolic connotations of um, color, particularly in mortuary rituals, from ancient British societies um, are, are quite really revealing. Here are a, a couple here. Um, this is uh, Melanie Giles, uh, Forge Glamour, which looks at um, color, particularly enameling in metalworking, and this is a recent um, quite comprehensive study by Hochul of colour symbolism in Iron Age material culture. The, in the Roman world, there's also da, 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 uh, Mark Bradley's 2011 Colour and Meaning in Ancient Rome, where he explores how colour language was used in the Roman world, particularly by politicians and orators, to organise and classify and evaluate their world. So we know that colour is important. We know that let me put this down here so it's not rustling so much. So we know the colour is important to humans. We know it can symbolise other materials or ideas. But how do we harness this? And how do we make it work for us in interpreting burials from Roman Britain? Well, I would suggest a two-pronged approach. Colour as both a conduit for material and a symbolic trigger of social cultural ideas, but also as a way in to thinking about ritual action. If we take Chapman's model, which incorporates those environmental universals and cultural impetus, we have two levels of colour resonance. Environmental, cultural, and to that, I've added an additional level of material triggers. And some of these overlap, and some not at all. For example, blood is both a physical, material product. It's also a cultural symbol, particularly in the Roman world. And you could, I suppose, class it as an environmental symbol because we all have blood within us. So understanding the relationship of colour to meaning within this universal sphere is perhaps the least problematic to discuss. Most would concede that the sky and sea are blue and the grass is green. As such, blue is often associated with water and air, while green is connected to vegetation. Similarly, day is light and night dark, often leading white and black to represent both in contrast. If we accept that environmental symbolic stimuli exist, then it's logical to suggest that these same associative connections may be defined by smaller social cultural impetus. While these cultural resonances may be more variable and potentially harder to isolate, they can be determined from language, actions, direct accounts and material culture. Finally, there is the inherent bond between colour and material. Colour and object are so linked that this nexus between colour and the physical leaves it open to either exploitation, if considered a passive element, or power, if framed as a proactive symbol. When we apply this to the Roman world, we get this. And some of these might look familiar to you, and you very helpfully helped me out at the back there. Uh, and I'm relieved, frankly, to say that quite a few of these um, seem to relate to, to your findings and, what, and what, where you chose to put your colours down. So gold, we have lots of wealth and sun. Uh, blue, we have water and sky. Uh, red, interestingly, we have the sky, but someone said it was a very specific time of day that they thought red and sky <coughs> went together. But otherwise, red was with blood, fire. Green, interestingly, was with vegetation, um, but some people, a couple of people also put it with the military, which is obviously very specific to our culture, where our military wears green. Um, it possibly wouldn't apply um, in other times or even geographical regions where military uniforms are a different colour. Um, what else have we got? Yellow um, was with amber in the sun, purple with royalty, silver or clear colours were placed with the moon, and black was with night and jet. Um, and you can have a look at the, the counters at the back if you uh, are interested. So this is all very well in theory, but how does it work in practice? How do we actually apply this to ancient, uh, an ancient burial environment? Well, I'll be looking specifically at the colours chosen to be displayed with the dead namely dress ornaments, necklaces, bracelets, belches, um, belts, brooches, hairpins, um, and we can see if any of these patterns exist in their display. So I popped this in here. I was going to talk more about this, but in the interest of time, um, I don't think I will. And also we've covered quite a lot of this um, in other interesting talks, specifically one previously, but I will just wanted to mention briefly um, lighting, which is why I brought the, uh, the black pod at the back there. Um, this is really kind of the other elements that go into the burial, not just the dress ornaments that I'm going to talk about, but you know, we've got the landscape, we've got textiles, um, the, the wood of coffins, you think about sort of natural wood types, which they're generally quite sort of light coloured, like you can see here. But lighting specifically, when were these um, funerals taking place? Day, night, there's some evidence 
that to suggest night. Um, and as I hope you got to experience at the back there, certain fabrics, materials, and shapes and colours look different in you know in candlelight or certain you know other lighting conditions. So that's just some something to bear in mind, and it's kind of part of a larger project which I'm not going to um, dip into too much here. So the case study I'm looking at is the Eastern Cemetery of Birmingham, London. Uh, it's a site of uh, 550 excavated inhumation burials. Um, of these, 56 contained items of personal dress. 37, uh, sorry, 377 cremation burials were not included in this. Um, and of these items, the colour breakdown looks like this. So we've got equal and high numbers of gold and black, and far, far fewer numbers of, say, blue. This is a multicoloured, and then. Um, some other sort of isolated instances of, of other colours there. This is uh, that same breakdown, but when you look at the actual object type relative to um, the sex of each burial, so you can get an idea of the kind of objects that, that we're looking at. Um, it should be noted that gold here is mostly related to copper alloy uh, material. Black is largely jet and shale. Uh, white is generally bone, and then these other kind of more um, like the blues and the greens, they tend to be sort of glass bead objects, and that's, that's sort of what, what we're looking at there. Um, just for comparison, this is the same same sort of uh, method done at sites, both sites of Nijmegen and also from the Lank Hill Cemetery, you can see like far, far higher numbers of, of colourful dress ornaments at both these sites. I chose to do the Eastern Cemetery just because I've got fuller data from that at the moment, and this is still a bit... Um, a work in progress, should we say, so I don't want to give you false information. But um, those quantities there are, are accurate. So um, this is back to Eastern Cemetery. This is uh, the different colours divided by sex. You can see that um, women have, if they have more, but there's not too much difference actually in the colours. Both have black, gold, multicoloured items. Um, and this is the same divided by the age, age ranges. Um, adults have got a, a big old spike, but that's kind of more symptomatic of the demographic of that particular site rather than anything else. And this is them in uh, worn and unworn positions. Um, the unworn category have quite, quite, quite some variants in their colours. Um, nine in total, including orange and green and grey, which appear in no other group. And um, there's a fairly even spread across the other groups of black and gold, and to a lesser extent, white objects. Um, and I suppose that really leads me into talking about the significant, the sensory experience of worn items, particularly at the point of funeral. This is obviously not from Roman Britain, but I think it's a nice example of just how eye-catching um, certain items of jewellery would be on the body. Um, largely worn items um, are visible in areas one might expect them to be. Bracelets uh, almost always found on the wrist with hairpins and combs around the head. Placing an item of jewellery on the body will naturally draw the gaze of viewers to certain areas of the deceased. With the addition of earrings, hairpins, necklaces, the head would gain visual precedence over the rest of the un an unadorned body. Visual objects on the body also provide areas of contact for mourners. After washing and redressing the dead, placing rings, bracelets and other items of adornment back onto the hands and wrists would have been an intimate act from mourner <laughs> to deceased. Placed on the wrists, the gold shine of a metal bracelet invites a visual cue towards the hands, while brooches on the shoulder or a necklace do the same for the face. Caressing, holding or talking to these areas of the body in grief, it is easy to envision that noticeable coloured objects located close by would help to humanise and lessen the corporeal realities of the body, such as coldness and the pale pallor of the skin. Oops. So if we go back to our three stages of colour symbolism and apply them to um, the Eastern Cemetery data we just looked at, we can see that there are multi-level le level degrees of, very, of um, tangibility within this. So the first is materials, material and colour symbolism. To what extent were materials of dress ornaments significant to mourners or were colours of these items in fact of greater importance? If a polished copper alloy bracelet shines like gold upon the wrist in bright sunlight, does it matter that it's not gold? Who would be able to tell? Is it the overall impression of goldness in burial that's most important to mourners? The majority of gold-coloured items in the Eastern Cemetery were in fact made of copper alloy. However, how obvious would this have been to mourners and did it matter? 
Perhaps those closest to the deceased would, who had a role in preparing the body, may have handled the dress ornaments they wore. But for most, their primary sensory stimuli would have been the visual. It's probable then that the, if a gold colour was present, irrespective of a genuine chemical composition of the item, it would trigger a memory and a recognition of gold itself, and that this was enough within the picture of burial. It's possible that real gold would have been too costly to deposit with the dead, and so a semblance of gold may have been used in certain cases. This could also be the case for iron in place of silver, shale in place of jet. In this cemetery, five jet bracelets were found. Whoever doubled this number were also found with a similar style made of shale. In addition, there's one iron bracelet present in this data, possibly mimicking um, silver of a similar style. And here in, is where cultural colour symbolism seems to come into play. The colour gold as a cultural symbol evokes wealth and opulence. Its presence within burials helps to make it appear a meaningful destruction of wealth on the part of those organising the funeral. The ability to provide a symbol of prestige to a family member at the point of burial demonstrates that the deceased was deemed worthy of the gift, that their character was good and their death mourned. By provisioning a body with a gold-coloured item, those closest to the dead would, consciously or unconsciously, be seen as generous, respectful and caring to the wider audience. This is not to say that these actions are undertaken cynically, however, residual social signals are unavoidably ingrained in the nature of opulent display and economic investment in death. Other examples of gold objects found in burials from the wider Roman Empire, such as gold hair nits from Slovenia, gold shoes from South Fleet in Kent, hint at an aspiration of goldness within the material culture of funerals selected by mourners, an echo of opulence which by association expresses status and respect. And finally, Environmentally or universally relevant colour resonances lead us once more to consider the most frequently occurring colours at the Eastern Cemetery, those of black and gold. Within this interpretive colour framework discussed previously, uh, black holds both environmentally salient symbolism with night and connections to death, the former likely influencing the latter. Gold accords with the sun and the associated light and warmth it produces. The complementary instances of these two colours suggest a duality, symbolising the closing of the day, light and dark, life and death. It's not merely single colours in isolation that prove significant, however, and the combination of certain colours together within a single dress ornament deserve a mention. For example, a dark blue and white beaded anklet in this group forms quite the striking visual symbol. Accepting pre-existing colour studies from Iron Age Britain that coloured objects can resonate with the natural world we can advance the argument that a similar awareness existed largely in the agricultural society of Roman Britain, even in London, which was a much smaller and more closely connected to the rural hinterland than today's modern city. The significance of seasonal changes which dictated the urban flow of daily life for many ancient people suggests that colours present in the natural landscape could trigger associations more readily than in viewers of a post-industrial age. The green of vegetation, blue of the sky, black of the night, were ever present colour associations in the lived experience of Roman Britons. That a mourner would give a loved one a black and white bracelet to wear in death and understand those colours to be of night and day or life and death is not difficult to envisage, particularly, as Sue mentioned earlier, in this liminal space of ritual. And finally, the above discussion and case study demonstrate the capacity colour has as a point of access for greater understanding of ritual action. Funerals were a complex sensory environment adorned with a diverse fusion of symbolism during a period of uncertainty within a particular community. The colours displayed with this unique environment derive from and reproduce meaningful, tangible social codes, which when applied in a cohesive way with other methods of interpretation can create a fuller perception of death and burial in Roman Britain. And that is it. So if anyone's got any questions.